derive the right-hand sides of the momentum equations. That is, the equations for the limits as the control volume goes to zero of the x-direction and y-direction forces acting on the control volume. Just as for an elastic object, the internal forces in a fluid create internal stresses in the fluid that we will represent by a stress tensor sigma, just as we did for stressed elastic objects. Given sigma, the tractions on each side of a control volume are as shown in the diagram. And that's the same diagram we used in our analyses of elastic objects. This diagram shows the x-direction forces acting on the control volume obtained by multiplying the x-direction tractions in the previous slide by the length of the side to which they are applied. Equation 1 is the sum of the x-direction forces divided by the control volume and equation 2 is that equation rearranged. Taking the limit of the previous equation as dx and dy approach 0, we have that the x component of force per unit volume acting at the point xy is given by the partial derivative of sigma xx with respect to x plus the partial derivative of sigma yx with respect to y. There are two sources of stress on the control volume, stress due to hydrostatic pressure and stress due to fluid motion. Hydrostatic pressure at a point is represented by a function p of x and y, and the traction it exerts on a surface is always normal compressive and equal to minus p times the area of the surface. There is no equation for p in terms of velocity derivatives and that will present a problem for us which we will turn to when we compute solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations. For the rest of this vid we'll concentrate on the stress caused by fluid motion called deviatoric stress and usually represented by the simple tau. There are three assumptions for deviatoric stress. They are, deviatoric stress is a linear function of strain rates, deviatoric stress is zero when the strain rates are zero, and the stress to strain rate relation is isotropic, that is, it's the same for every set of orthonormal coordinates. We'll derive expressions for the deviatoric stress components in terms of strain rates and then express the strain rates as functions of velocity gradients. The diagram shows the fluid in the control volume at time t and then the same fluid at time t plus dt. We can view the fluid at time t plus dt as a stressed, i.e. displaced version of the fluid at time t. As with elastic objects, normal strain in fluids is defined as the change in length of the stressed object divided by its original length. Calculating the normal strain in the x direction, consider the side AB. The x component of the length of A prime B prime is the x component of B prime minus the x component of A prime, and subtracting the original length of AB, that is dx, and dividing by dx, we have the x direction strain as shown in equation one. Writing equation one using the u velocity function gives equation two, Simplifying, we have equation 3, and taking the limit as dx goes to 0, we have equation 4. So the x-direction normal strain on the fluid in the control volume is increasing at a rate equal to the partial derivative of u with respect to x. And similarly, the y-direction normal strain on the fluid in the control volume is increasing at a rate equal to the partial derivative of v with respect to y. How about shear strain? As with elastic materials, shear strain in fluids is defined as the change in the angle of the x and y axes in the stressed, i.e. displaced, object. We use the small angle approximation that theta x equals sine theta x and theta y equals sine theta y. 
Note that the sine of theta y is given by u of x comma y plus dy minus u of x comma y times dt. The opposite side divided by dy, the adjacent side, and taking the limit as dy goes to zero gives equation one. So that theta y at time t plus dt equals the partial derivative of u with respect to y times dt. Similarly, theta x at time t plus dt equals the partial derivative of v with respect to x times dt as shown in equation two. Thus the total shear strain at the time t plus dt is given by the sum of the partial derivatives times dt, that is equation three. And the rate of change of the shear strain is the sum of the derivatives, that is the partial derivative of u with respect to y plus the partial derivative of v with respect to x. The Jacobian of the u and v velocities is a candidate for the strain rate tensor. However, as was the case for elastic objects, we need to partition the Jacobian into a symmetric strain rate tensor and an anti-symmetric rotation rate tensor as shown. The strain rate tensor has the partial derivatives of u with respect to x and v with respect to y on the diagonal and the sum of the partial derivative of u with respect to y and the partial derivative of v with respect to x divided by two on the off diagonals. The diagram shows a shear traction equal to the force F applied over the area A. The traction is applied to a plate resting on a fluid and the motion of the plate induces motion in the fluid. The shear traction F over A induces a corresponding stress tau yx equaling F divided by A along the top boundary of the fluid. On the top boundary, the fluid is moving at the plate velocity, represented by V, and at the bottom boundary, the velocity of the fluid is zero. Newton's law of viscosity states that the fluid velocity at location x comma y equals y divided by L times V, where y is the distance from the bottom plate and L is the distance between the plates. That is, the velocity increases linearly with y. If we consider the fluid at time t and then again at time t plus dt, the fluid appears to be distorted by a shear strain equal to theta as shown in the diagram. Using the small angle approximation, theta equals v times dt over l, so the shear strain increases at a rate of v over l. Newton's law also states that the shear stress tau yx equals mu times the strain rate, where the constant mu is called the viscosity coefficient and is a property of the fluid. The viscosity coefficient mu is defined by this equation. Hooke's law describes the relationship between stress and strain for elastic objects. As we will see, stress acting on a fluid creates strain that changes with time. We need to find the relationship between stress and strain rate in a fluid analogous to Hooke's law relating stress and strain for elastic objects. We are assuming that the relationship is linear, and the most general linear relationship is defined by a 4x4 four four matrix as shown. Since the fluid is isotropic, the matrix relating stress to strain rate is the same regardless of the orthonormal coordinates used for U and V. Note that because of the continuity equation, the Y normal strain rate equals the negative of the X normal strain rate. So we can replace the first two entries in the first row by a single number as shown by the equation at the bottom of the page, and similarly for the first two entries in the second row. We will be able to use this one example, the viscosity law demonstration, to fill in the entire stress to strain rate relationship matrix. For the viscosity law demonstration, the strain rate tensor has zero on the diagonals and theta dot over two on the off diagonals. The stress tensor has zeros on the diagonal and mu times theta dot in the lower left corner. From Newton's viscosity law, tau yx equals mu times theta dot. 
so we can fill in the two entries in the fourth row of the matrix as shown. Also, since the normal stresses in the viscosity law demonstration are zero, and the shear strain rate is non-zero, we can fill in the upper quadrant of the matrix with zeros as shown. Now we utilize the fact that the fluid is isotropic, so we can exchange the x and y axes without changing the relationship matrix. So letting the new x prime axis be the original y axis and the new y prime axis be the original x axis, we have using the original coordinates that tau xx equals lambda 1 times the x normal strain rate. And using the new coordinates we have that tau y prime y prime equals lambda 2 times the y prime normal strain rate. Since the y prime axis is the x axis, lambda 1 must equal lambda 2, and we can replace them with a single lambda. Also, tau xy equals tau y prime x prime, and tau y prime x prime equals mu times theta dot, so we can fill in the third row of the matrix as shown. Now we're going to change coordinate systems and write the stress tensor and strain rate tensor in the new coordinates. The new coordinate system will be the original system with the axes rotated 45 degrees. The rotation matrix R is given as shown and from a previous video we derived the coordinate transformation matrices for vectors and covectors as summarized at the bottom of the page. The stress tensor maps a surface unit normal vector to the vector stress on that surface, so it is a rank 2 type VC tensor. The strain rate tensor maps a unit direction vector to the strain rate vector for that direction, so it also is a rank 2 type VC tensor. We derived as an exercise the coordinate transformation matrices for rank 2 type VC tensors in a previous video, and the derivation is also given in the exercises to this vid. Now we'll bypass the formal derivation and construct the coordinate transformation matrices by hand. Given a rank 2 type VC tensor tau and original or E coordinates, we will construct the coordinate transformation matrices to rewrite it in rotated or F coordinates. We start with a vector in F coordinates, V, and convert it to E coordinates by multiplying it by our transpose. Then we multiply by the tensor tau to map the vector to its target in E coordinates. Then we convert the result to F coordinates by multiplying it by Q transpose. So the target vector in F coordinates is Q transpose times tau times R transpose times V. Q transpose equals R and R transpose equals Q, so the coordinates of tau in the F basis are I times the E basis coordinate component matrix of tau times Q. Now we convert the stress and strain rate tensors from the viscosity law demonstration to F coordinates rotated 45 degrees from the original E coordinates as shown. In the rotated coordinates, both the stress and strain rate tensors are diagonal matrices. In rotated coordinates, the normal x strain rate is theta dot over 2, and the normal x stress is mu times theta dot, therefore lambda equals 2 times mu. Also, since the normal strain rates are non-zero, while the shear stress is zero, we can fill in the lower quadrant of the relationship matrix with zeros as shown, and the matrix is complete. Summarizing, we have the stress tensor partitioned into a pressure stress tensor and a deviatoric stress tensor. The second line shows the deviatoric stress tensor written in terms of strain rates. And the third line shows the deviatoric stress tensor written in terms of velocity gradients. From an earlier slide, we have that the right-hand side of the x-momentum equation 
equals the partial derivative of the x normal stress with respect to x plus the partial derivative of the y x shear stress with respect to y. And now we can write the right hand side of the x momentum equation in terms of velocity gradients as shown at the bottom of the page. And all that remains is to simplify this expression as shown on the next slide. The first equation is the equation from the previous slide expanded. The second line is obtained by reversing the order of differentiation for the second order partial derivative of b with respect to x and y, and then applying the continuity equation to eliminate two of the terms. And finally, we have the right-hand side of the Navier-Stokes equations. Looking at the FDM substitution for the Laplacian, we see that its value at grid point i, j is a multiple of the average value of the variable at points that are neighbors to i, j minus the value at i, j. So when u of i, j is approximately equal to the average value of its neighbors, the viscosity term is approximately zero. When u of i, j is greater than the average value of its neighbors, the Laplacian is negative and the viscosity term exerts a negative force at i, j. When u of i, j is less than the average value of its neighbors, then the viscosity term is positive and it exerts a positive force at i, j. We have derived the Navier-Stokes equations and it's taken us a while, so let's briefly summarize the derivation. We started with Newton's second law of motion, force equals mass times acceleration, and wrote it in the equivalent form, force equals the rate of change of momentum. The Reynolds transport theorem states that the rate of change of momentum in a small control volume equals the rate that momentum is flowing into the control volume plus the force acting on the control volume. We move the rate that momentum is flowing into the control volume to the left side of the equation, and we divide this equation by the volume of the control volume and take the limit as the volume approaches zero, and the result is the Navier-Stokes momentum equations. Going term by term, the limit of the change in x momentum per unit volume is rho times the partial derivative of u with respect to x. The limit of the x momentum flow rate in the control volume per unit volume is minus rho times u times the partial derivative of u with respect to x plus v times the partial derivative of u with respect to y. On the right side of the equation we have the limit of x force on the control volume per unit volume due to fluid pressure is minus the partial derivative of pressure with respect to x and we have spent this video showing that the limit of x force due to fluid motion on the control volume per unit volume equals the viscosity coefficient mu times the Laplacian of u. And we're done with the derivation. The assignment is to review each part of the derivation. Also, you might want to try to derive the component transformation matrices for a rank 2 type BC tensor for a coordinate change. And you might want to try to write the program for graphing the stress and strain rate tensors as the coordinate frame is rotated as we did in the video. The derivation and the program are given below.